I'd like to start, Brian and Anna Marie, um, by talking about the, the, the one thing that is completely different about you than almost anyone that I know, very, whether we're talking about a doctor, nutritionist, dietitian, there's one thing that's completely different about when you speak and anyone else. You have been witnesses to what happens when people follow a certain lifestyle. So there's all kinds of theories out there, but you for 40 years have witnessed, watched people every day follow a certain lifestyle. So you know the answer to a question that people all over would like to know, and that question is, if I follow this lifestyle that you speak about, what should my expectation be? Is there, is, you, is there an expectation that you could actually, by following this lifestyle, prevent obesity? Is this something that's possible? Are you saying that with this lifestyle, you could prevent type 2 diabetes? Are you saying, you know, with this lifestyle, you could dramatically, dramatically affect heart disease? And again, I'm not talking about the theory. I'm saying what you've seen. So my first question is, if someone followed the lifestyle you're speaking of, as you've witnessed 20,000, 100,000 people eating this way, what from the prevention side is possible to prevent in a world where disease is, skyrock is skyrocketing? You know, we live with uh, a never-ending passion for what we do. And, uh, you know, uh, in my work, I started very young, and uh, I thought that lifestyle diet was just to be fit for athletes and you know just to be fit and to realize that you could decrease pain you could maybe totally get rid of pain which I saw at this very young age I was 18 when I came into this field and I was on cloud nine I couldn't believe that people just would come in I thought when you have, for example, arthritis or really severe rheumatoid arthritis or really severe asthma where you're in and out of hospitals all the time or you have uh, psoriasis all throughout your body and you're suffering enormously, that slowly but surely as weeks and months would go, you would recover. And I was on cloud nine. I just could not believe that this is happening and because normally my upbringing, everybody who had some problem lived with that and died with that problem and lived on medication. So to see that was to learn to not take no for an answer ever. And because there's always possibilities. And there is no cure for anything unless we totally change lifestyle, which is the whole lifestyle with the passion of life, following your heart, following your commitment, and you know, it, there is no cure. I found with myself that um, whatever problem I had in my life, because I had chronic migraines for a long time and they were so severe they ended up in seizures and that was very much stress related and diet related. So as I healed myself from all that through the raw living foods, and I got rid of all sugars, because they obviously was something I lived on. <laughs> and then that is something that I own, though. I own that weakness. And so whatever we have had, so let's say that I did have rheumatoid arthritis, which I followed so many people that have looked like they totally healed themselves. They, they got totally mobility back. They were totally off all the medicines and they were as happy as could be, and then life happens, and we get to hear, I got off the program. <laughs> and, and it's not really a program, it's a lifestyle, you know, it's not something we do for a short time, it's, it's for life. So it's a choice, and we have this amazing choice to stay healthy, and to stay happy, and that, that really, sometimes, the first time I would see that would be somebody would come to our clinic in Sweden, for example, and they would have left after a few months, I mean, amazingly healthy. And then maybe three years later, they'd be back in enormous amount of pain and back full of medication. And you're like, what on earth happened? How, how could it go from one to the other? 
and you realize that we have to be aware that we own this weakness. And that whatever weakness we had. If I had cancer once, let's say I had breast cancer, this is what usually I will get back if I don't commit myself. So it's not to scare somebody. For me, it's been the best thing. It actually will keep you on a straight and narrow, and you'll be healthier than you ever could dream of. So, you know, I just want everybody to understand there is no cure because we are medically, we're so used to take this pill, it will cure you. This, this surgery will cure you. Cure is in the daily lifestyle that you are committing to and that you are choosing to do. Mm. Thank you. She certainly keeps me on the straight now. <laughs> So coming from uh, a dramatically different background than health, I guess if there's an anti-health, that's where I came from. Uh, when I began to transform, first as a vegetarian, as a vegan, as a macrobiotic, and then eventually to a raw food consumer, I wanted to look for a place that had the most experience. And that's what led me to Boston, to Ann Wigmore and Hippocrates. At the time I joined the staff, they had actually been in operation for 20 years and had this extraordinary history. And almost by default, uh, due to the fact that nobody would ever think of taking responsibility for their health back in the 50s and 60s and the 70s even, uh, very, very sick people came to Hippocrates. The sickest people I've ever seen in my life. And believe me, growing up in a large Catholic family, I saw a lot of sick people. Especially uh, the ones that were drunk all of the time. Mm -hmm. And when I met Ann Wigmore, she was zany. You know, she was an extraordinary figure in lots of ways. She had what I perceived as little to no intellect and passion larger than a mountain. And she had reversed disease in her own life and was utterly committed to the fact that diet and attitude and God and spirituality, she had that part of her, could remedy anything. And of course, coming from a background and being much younger and still trying to find my personality, who I was, and yes, I was eating a plant-based diet and what remarkable differences that was, but I was still trying to find who I was emotionally and as a human being, as a man. I had questions, but as the days and the months and then the years ticked by and I watched these remarkable shifts in people's health, the, the sickest people starting to recover, I recognized that the wisdom of health is not about fixing, it's about preventing. Mm -hmm. And even when you're sick, really, really sick, you're still trying to prevent it from getting worse. So let's look at it in a totally different way rather than say, hey, we're going to eliminate a disease. No, you're trying to prevent something from getting worse. So the first step is that. Now, anyone who's at least slightly reasonable would recognize that whatever you do as far as opening your mouth and drinking something or swallowing it has to have an impact on your body. One of the things that always come to mind when I think of this is, is Dr. Campbell's statement. The most intimate relationship you ever have is with food. I'm totally in love with my wife, but I don't eat her and swallow her. I do that with food, as you do several times a day. What's more intimate than that? Now to somehow disconnect that that may have to do with your health, you'd have to be completely out of your mind. But how have we done that today? How have we actually done that? Highly educated professionals sit in front of me and debate me and others and say that this is the oddity. How can we get to that point where we're so detached from that intimate act? The other thing is chemistry, you know, we think of ourselves as cute or handsome and we get in mirrors and we comb our hairs and 
putting makeup on, not me, but Anna, and clothes on. Sometimes, you know, like Halloween I put makeup on. Well, that's what some say, I'm not sure. But, <laughs> uh, but the, the, the reality of this whole thing is that we're chemistry. That we're 100 trillion cells, we, you know, we're mostly water, which is remarkable in itself, which is oxygen. And, and how would it not be a chemical process to consume nutrition? Now, if you have a car, I don't care what type of car that is, but if you like your car, the last thing you would ever do is put a fuel or something that wasn't a fuel into the gas tank. How about if I decided today, let's invent a new thing rather than gasoline. I'm tired of paying so much money for petrol. So I'm going to go out and I'm going to put soap into my, into my automobile. Do you think we're going to get very far? And do you think you're going to break the engine? Well, you've done it to your body. So why be so surprised about that? You've been putting the wrong chemistry into your wrong chemistry, your biochemistry, and the end result is we end up with these diseases that we have specialists now. You know, when I was a boy, you had one doctor who came to the house, who we all loved, by the way. We used to stand in line and hug the doctor, my two brothers and I, because we loved the man. He was, a good, he was like part of our family. He was a good guy. And he meant well, and he was really concerned. And, you know, how do we get from that to, when I ask some of my colleagues who question, they say, well, I don't know that, um, that's not my specialty. You have to go over here. And then you go and ask, well, that, uh, it's, it's a shame, that's my specialty. You know, it's one body, one biochemistry, and we're talking about, in this particular case, nutrition. So, Anna Marie and I have had the privilege uh, for a total of over 80 years, 85, 86, 87 years total, uh, to watch people who have the courage to do what is told to them is odd. You know, it's odd, food can't help you, it's quackery, there's no common sense, there's no empirical evidence in this. Uh, you know, before we do anything, obviously, we have to be so cerebral, uh, we, we won't do common sense things. We've been watching thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands, endless thousands of people, it's a joy, bring about their own recoveries. Now, you went through a plethora of diseases. It, cancer, you know. In this group you, you're in, there's people here with you that had stage four cancer and were told by the top doctors at top Ivy League universities, there's nothing that can be done that you're going to die, and they brought about their own recovery. And diet is part of that. Now, what you heard today, by the way, about the emotional state, not only am I in, on board with that, I think why you or I are who we are is first and foremost because of our emotional state. But you can have a great emotional state and eat garbage and end up dead. But can you imagine marrying a great emotional state with great food that fuels you. Well, I can imagine it because that's what I did. <laughs> and that's what I've seen people do. And I watch people reverse major diseases. Not because it is some empirically proven idea, which it is, by the way. I can give you volumes of data, and I write that in my books for doctors and for researchers. Very few doctors and researchers read those books because they're more interested in debating than reading their own science. And so, bottom line is, but common sense people out there say, gee, that does make sense. I've seen people with, you know, you've heard it several times during this conference, and you're gonna hear it over the next eight days, several more times. Diseases like cardiovascular disease, in great part, are not diseases. Now, to say it's not a disease at all is ridiculous, because I, I believe two or three percent of cardiovascular disease is an impaired valve. But that means 97 or 98 percent is you're eating the wrong quote food or you're eating things that are not food or not the right fuel. You're not exercising and you're under stress. In this room today you heard that stress creates 85, 90 percent of diseases. I agree with that because I know one thing, as bad as I ate when I was stressed, I ate worse. How about you? 
But it's the first thing you do. You open your mouth and eat more garbage when you're not happy with yourself. Uh, diabetes type 2, that one I do think is 100% correctable. I've never worked with a type 2 diabetic who's been under the care of a great doctor who's willing to work with them and basically say, okay, uh, I know you don't want to take the medicine anymore. So slowly, you don't just rip it away from somebody. That medical doctor, that expert, basically slowly helps them come off the medicine. Now, type 1 diabetes is not in the same category, but great improvements. Multiple sclerosis. You know, we recently have a young, young nurse, 35-year-old nurse, who came to us walking in a brace. This beautiful, well-educated, attractive, intelligent woman who works as a heroic nurse up in New York City area. And that brace was off in five days. And just last week, we heard that she no longer is diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. <laughs> Parkinson's disease, ALS, Alzheimer's disease. This group, I've never seen anyone in advanced stages reverse it. But in early stages, obviously, you can halt it. And if you're lucky, it doesn't go further. And if you're super lucky, and have everything going, you may be able to do what this young nurse did. And I give one story, you know, again, I could give you, because I'm Irish, I could give you 44 years of stories if you want. And we keep going. And if I'd run out of stories, I'll make some up. <laughs> you know, so it's endless, Stephen, it's endless. And I, I, I've never seen any disorder not improved. You're not going to reverse every disorder, but Everyone improves when you improve your lifestyle. 